You want to say something, oh, yeah. Francesca? Yeah. He's on. Okay. We can't hear him well. Salman? Yes. Yeah. Okay. That now is working. Perfect. Brilliant. Oh, ah, yeah. good to have you there, Francisco. Oh, for me too. I'm sorry for the beginning, but I, I was just trying to connect to the server. So sorry for the delay. No, no, it's fine. It's, it's, it's all right because we are waiting for all these people to connect as well. There's so many people ah, okay, trying, okay. trying to come That's in. Wonderful. We have gone to 140 already, which is good. Uh, yes. you, know, you know Greg Trost, Greg? He's yeah. as our morning. Thank you, Greg. And I'm nice just to see as well, yeah. Okay, so uh, you want to screen share and uh, uh, we're yeah. going to start. Hey, sorry, I just uh, to take the presentation and share. So in one second, I am ready. And Pragnesh Bhatt has joined as well from UK, which is good. Sure, okay. Okay. Brilliant. Um, uh, just want to introduce um, Francisco. Francisco is a dear friend from uh, Milan. Um, he's um, the chief of the um, neuro oncology division um, in neurosurgery uh, in Milan. Uh, Humanitas is, is an amazing place in Milan. I visited there. Um, he's having a great time. There's lots of interesting gadgets that they play with. So, guys, uh, it's, uh, we are honored to have him here today. He's going to be talking about thoracolumbar trauma. Okay, off you go. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, really, thank you to give me this opportunity to take this lecture about the uh, management of thoracolumbar trauma. Um, the incidence, uh, we know that is very important. It's different from uh, each country, obviously. This is the data from Italy. The main things, I think, that the, the main of the trauma is on the thoracolumbar region between T11, L1, but we can extend it a little more between uh, T10 to L2 that represented 25% of the fracture. And uh, almost 50, 20% are associated with neurological deficits. So for a neurosurgeon is a very hot topic, the management of a thoracolumbar fracture. Uh, they, we can recognize different causes and this can change obviously by um, country by for the country but um, car accidents false sports uh, are the main activities and we have to take in mind that some different metabolic disease and um, other um, pathologies that uh, can disrupt the architecture of the vertebral body can also be cause of a vertebral um, fracture that are secondary to these pathologies but we can accumulate to this topic to the management um, I start from biomechanics because uh, if we understand some uh, points of biomechanics, we can understand how a fracture can arrive and how we can reconstruct this fracture. So we know that in a normal condition, the fulcrum of the um, loading uh, forces is uh, inside, in the middle of the column. So, um, and usually a normal structure of a vertebral body can absorb this uh, uh, loading sharing. And uh, only with very high cinetic forces or in uh, some pathologies, we can have some disruption and have the fracture. And uh, usually the compressive signs are the most important uh, to have a disruption, especially of the vertebral body. So uh, in uh, some condition, we can have uh, a compressive uh, alteration of, the, of uh, the forces and have a fracture on the anterior part that is the main uh, cause. But uh, if we have to think about the anatomy of the spinal cord, we have to think separately on the different part because in the upper thoracic part, we have a very rigid spine because uh, there is the rib and uh, there is a kyphosis. So the flexion injuries are the most relevant. The thoracolumbar, why is the I, mm, the location where we can observe majorly the, the fracture? Because we change from kyphosis to lordosis. Uh, we can change from a mobile to a mobile um, spinal cord. So 
the strength and the forces, uh, the, um, the, the load sharing is uh, act in a different way in the different part of this, uh, um, of this uh, uh, tract of the column. While in the lumbar spine where there is a load doses, the axial loading is the most relevant also because it's the basis of all our column. And depending of the dynamic of the trauma and where the forces can arrive, we can have a disruption of different elements from anterior to the middle part to the posterior part. And they can combine in a different type of uh, fracture. Here we can, I, I summarize in four main categories according to the type of the fracture from compression, the burst fraction, flexion distraction, and finally the fraction dislocation. The compression fracture, as I said, is the most common, usually is in the anterior part of the vertebral body and uh, is due to a compression of our loading uh, forces. And uh, the most common causes are, are the force and the motor vehicle accidents. But it's the typical fracture of um, osteoporosis because I show before a slide where the architecture of the vertebral body is disrupted is disrupt, sorry, and uh, it's not possible to have a good um, load sharing in, through the vertebral bodies. A bus fracture is similar, the mechanism of the fracture is similar, but the cinetic of the force is higher. So all the body is, dis is disrupted, especially the posterior element. And this kind of uh, fracture usually is uh, um, associated with neurological injury because we can observe the alteration of the posterior elements that can go through the spinal cord uh, to the spinal canal where we can have a spinal cord or nerve at all. Flexion distraction fracture uh, that is typical for the car accident is when we have a flexion movement um, but uh, with the an opposition in the anterior part of the body, typical of the set belt injury, uh, because uh, there is something that uh, contrasts these forces and the disruption is the, of the posterior element. So the um, spinal process, the ligaments, but also the pedicle, because the fulcrum is just in the posterior part of the vertebral body. And uh, can also associate with the abdominal trauma due to the compression for the seat belt. This is a very typical. And the main location of this fracture is L1 due to the seat belt uh, for sure. Uh, finally, there is the fracture dislocation is the most complex type of fracture and uh, is due to many variation of combination of forces and is the most instable of all the, um, the fracture and it usually is associated with the, a very important neurological uh, deficit. So it's uh, um, very co complex to manage in emergency because we have to consider that there is a very high cinetic uh, uh, trauma uh, and sometimes the patients have also other problems so it's a very challenging uh, type of fracture. But in clinical practice we can summarize um, it's correct that this uh, uh, webinar is mainly due for residents is correct Salman? Yeah okay okay it's just uh, because some uh, information are more basilar than for uh, experienced surgeon but just to have uh, the management uh, we have to consider three main steps the the first that is very important is to have a neurological examination obviously when a, a patient arrives in emergency department first of all we have to stabilize the patients because sometimes in the trauma we have also other problems so first of all to stabilize the patient after that, we have to have a neurological definition of this condition, then have a diagnosis and a classification of a fracture. And finally, we have to think about the treatment that can be surgical and not. Why is important the neurological examination? Obviously, because we can have different kind of syndrome according if there is a complete or incomplete uh, spinal cord injury, but also because when you are in emergency and you don't have so many time, it's very important, it's crucial to try to define by the clinics the level of the lesion to try to focalize your, um, uh, your exam. 
um, it depends from the parts of the world. Sometimes the MRI is very hard to have in early management, uh, um, in the early phase of the trauma. So if you are able to focalize where is where can be the trauma, you can focalize also your radiological department. About the syndrome, obviously the most uh, uh, the worst is the complete spinal cord injury, where uh, there is a complete loss of sensory, motor, and uh, sphincter dysfunction, and they usually are uh, associated with, with a very high degree trauma and uh, with dislocation. According to the level, we can recognize a different level of uh, um, of a plegia that can be complete for a cervical trauma or incomplete partial like a paraplegia from intermammillary or lower according to the level of the lesion. The incomplete spinal cord injury are, as I said, uh, we can recognize uh, four main uh, syndromes according where is uh, into the spinal cord the damage. Um, the central cord syndrome is the most frequent, it usually is associated with the spinal cord trauma. So it's not the topic of this uh, lecture, but uh, I have to mention about uh, this syndrome and it usually is connected with extension injury of the spine. The anterior cord syndrome usually is uh, the part affected is the anterior part of the spinal cord, so we can understand that the flexion injury in this kind of patient is the predominant um, type of injury. And the, um, the syndrome comprises with a motor and sensitivity loss below the level of the lesion, but we have the preservation of the posterior tract, so the proprioceptive, uh, the vibration um, um, sensation. So it's uh, important to discriminate with the neurological exam because uh, in this phase, we are before to obtain an MRI or a CT scan. So it's just to have a um, big idea. The bronze acquired syndrome is uh, an hemicord injuries so on the left side or on the right side and they usually is uh, due to the penetrating trauma that arrive from the side and we have just a ipsilateral loss of motor function and proprioceptive vibration while we have a contralateral loss of pain and temperature because there is a different level of the concession of this uh, of the track exactly here are some scheme that you can easily recognize. The posterior core syndrome is a very rare correlation, usually is um, due to trauma in, in hyperflexion, but it's very rare to have a poor posterior core syndrome in trauma, but sometimes it can be happened, especially if it's associated with the tumor, a posterior element tumor of the vertebral canal with a trauma, we can recognize this syndrome, but uh, daily practice is very rare. Well, the spinal shock is a, com a temporary but complete loss below the level of the lesion of the sensibility, motor, muscle tone and reflexes. So it's very important. Usually we observe this and we understand that this uh, a, a spinal shock after some hours, 12, 24, 14 hours usually. You now we can recognize also alteration of the reflex that can give us uh, an idea of the timing of the trauma if it, it is not arrived directly from the emergency department. And uh, it's very important, in my opinion, especially when we have to, take, uh, to talk between um, different colleagues, to have uh, a same way, a same language. So the ASEA classification is a very easy way to classify the spinal cord injury and to transmit information between the anesthetist or all the doctors that are involved in the emergency. So uh, I suggest always to try to classify um, the, the syndrome, but, but also the fracture because so we have a common uh, language. Um, it's very easy because we can recognize five classes from a complete uh, damage that is ASEA O A to as a E that is uh, without any damage. So it's very easy, you can find, and I think it's very important. When we have defined the um, clinical um, exam, we have to move to the radiological department where X-ray and CT scan, I think right now is uh, uh, worldwide uh, possible in uh, almost uh, the, all the main hospital. While the MRI in uh, 
emergency can be very difficult to obtain. So sometimes it's very difficult to, uh, to obtain a worst spine MRI. So if uh, we can uh, focalize uh, where the suspect after the CT scan, uh, that can be very good. When we have performed um, the CT scan, we can find two types of uh, um, situation. One where is uh, the evidence of a fracture, so it's our topic, but we have to re remember that there is a, a pathology, a condition that is the shiwara, where we have the spinal cord injury, so patients have symptoms without any documentation of compression, dislocation, fracture, so we have to think about uh, this, that there is also this condition, but when we have a fracture, the other important things is to classify. Why is it important to classify? We can find different kinds of classification through the years from the Dennis model to the mother of the whole spine and the thoracic lumbar injury classification. Uh, it's important to try to have uh, uh, a scheme for us to understand what kind of fracture must to be treated and also to communicate, especially if we have to think that the patients arrive in a hospital where there is not a neurosurgery department and a way to transfer, we have a common language. I think the most uh, useful and uh, in this phase, the most uh, complete classification is the new how classification that, that fuse the two main important classification, the Telixa and the how manual classification that uh, analyze uh, the different part of the, the vertebral body. So we can recognize the type, a, type E with the vertebral body fracture, type B with the failure of the posterior or anterior tension band. And finally, the type C with the, the destruction uh, fracture. But there is also information about the clinic, clinical status. This because, because uh, Finally, this is a scheme you can find very easily in, uh, in the web, uh, is uh, available from our um, site. So it's very easy, you can uh, print and uh, you have just to have an idea to classify. But why they introduce uh, also the neurological status? Because uh, we have to think about treatment and uh, there is no a real guideline to how to treat a fracture. There is some algorithm that uh, help us to define if a fracture is, uh, must be managed in a conservative way or must be operated on. But there is also a gray zone where you can choose from non-operative or operative surgery. There is some different algorithm with a, a grading and with a point according to the type of the fracture and to the neurological uh, deficit. This is uh, from the, the AO surgical algorithm from the, the AO. And then you see that the neurological status is uh, very important if you don't have any kind of uh, a neurological deficit, uh, you can think about conservative, but according if the fracture is considered stable or unstable, this is, uh, I, I think is important, is uh, a way. Also, if uh, the big problem is that uh, it's very difficult to standardize, probably if you give an MRI or a CT scan to different surgeon, there is some difference in classification because some part is not very clear. Uh, so ju just to have uh, some main information. And I said that there is a gray zone where it's very difficult to understand. So the importance of the MRI is to understand the integrity of this posterior ligament that give another information about the stability of the spinal cord, of the spinal column, sorry. And there is different uh, um, algorithms. So you can find out what do you think is most convenient to the, your daily practice. but um, how we want to arrive here to the treatment. As I said, we can have non-surgical treatment, main of the fracture not, uh, must be treated conservatively. So, but what it's mean the conservative treatment? Patient must have a bed rest because it reduce the loading share of the, the spinal cord. It's the first objective. The second is the use of a brace of orthosis. And finally, you have to plan a clinical neurological follow-up is very important. 
The role of the brace is to maintain the spine alignment, to mobilize the spine during the healing process, and finally to control pain when the patient have his movement just to have food or to go to the bathroom because he have to restrict movement. And according to the level of the fracture, you have to think that uh, each type of uh, um, orthosis have different uh, target. So uh, it's not always uh, correct to use uh, um, a camp uh, orthosis because uh, it's arrived to a one. For, so for a, 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 a fracture that is below that level, is better to use a lumbar brace or a tailor that is a wide as a, um, a load sharing. And I think that is a very important point. You have to consider that with the conserva conservative treatment, the time of healing of a vertebral fracture is to range from eight to 12 weeks. So uh, this is the time that you have to say to the patient and where you have to organize your clinical and radiological follow-ups. Because before this date, the fracture, uh, the vertebral body can also have a progression and you can have a problem in the late problem according to the um, sagittal alignment to uh, a vertebral fracture that is not correctly healed. So this is a scheme from uh, what can be happen in a conservative treatment. The patient uh, with a, a compressive fracture uh, in a L, I think is L1, no, is a T12, sorry. And uh, it tried to compensate with, because with the conservative treatment, you are not able to change and to correct the sagittal alignment, but you maintain this. So you can understand that finally you can have some problem correlated with other pathologies, especially in the elderly. This is a, a problem in the healing process of osteoporotic fracture that you can have also other degenerative problem and that you can have an imbalance of the sagittal on the on uh, sagittal plane. While the surgical uh, treatment is for the very unstable or to prevent this kind of the problem. We have many different uh, surgical possibilities that, that can be shared and that can be combined as we think is the better way. We can go from a vertebral plastic that is usually the indication for osteoporotic fracture to a 360 degree reconstruction. It depends of uh, what is the type of biomechanical needed for the patient? The aim of the surgery is the compression if there is a, a neurological syndrome, that is uh, the first aim. The second is to stabilize and to reconstruct directly the spinal cord. And according to where is the problem, where is the factor, we can have a different type of surgery. Or an anterior fixation or combine the two. Uh, fixation according to what is the biomechanical is this is why I start to speak about biomechanics in uh, this presentation because we have to understand why the vertebral body the vertebral structure is uh, disrupted by the trauma so you can able to understand how to reconstruct this is very important just a few, few words about the timing of the treatment because it is a very debate. There, here, there is some guideline that uh, they said that early management is preferable, but there is not enough evidence to make a conclusion, to make a guideline. But I want just uh, to, to, to present our results of uh, the Spinal Committee, the WFNS, the Spinal Committee Conference uh, about the trauma. And finally, we um, decided that uh, the compressive surgery, so in the case of spinal cord injury, is an effective treatment and must be performed as soon as possible and preferably within the 24 hour. This is a recommendation. It's not a guideline because I said that there is not enough condition to make a guideline, but it's a, the official um, recommendation of the WFNS uh, society. And finally, we arrive to the trauma, uh, to the fracture. What, what kind of procedure we can perform? 
uh, I so I show you there is no a unique way to treat the same factor. This is a, a young male with the non uh, neurological deficit with a I3 fracture. We perform, for example, in this case, because there was not the necessity to perform the compression, a uh, uh, short percutaneous fixation. And in early management, we restore also a little bit of the kyphosis. This is the result. Because uh, if you perform surgery um, till 22 hours, is better. the better result to the kyphotic correction is that if you perform a surgery from 24 to 48 hour, you can do to uh, with the ligamental passes to reduce the fracture and to correct the kyphotic deformity. And this is the follow up at one year, and you can see how the posterior fragment was completely correct due to the ligamental passes. This is uh, a possible way to treat the patient. This is another fracture that start, uh, as you can see in the left part is a he one is a old female we treat her with a conservative treatment after at the first for an um, x-ray follow-up you can see that the vertebral body was split so it became a h2 uh, fracture so we decided at that moment we perform also a CT scan to perform a short fixation but is a uh, an option. It's not uh, the only way. We can also consider to treat her with a conservative treatment, but just to try to prevent deformity uh, because there was a, a progression of the fracture. And we decided to treat. And here you can see that we perform after 15 days, there is no at all correction of the deformity because uh, this is uh, possible only if you perform in early stages of the fracture. Some other cases, probably we can skip this that is the most easy and try to thinking about more complex fracture. I know that after we will have some cases discussion with the Gregory is correct. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Ah, okay. Okay. So I can uh, go very quick so we can have we can have a more time about discussion that I think is mostly interesting that uh, don't show some cases. Yeah, um, this is a, a way to treat. Uh, here there is a, um, a B2 fracture, so involvement of anterior and posterior elements. So the anterior reconstruction is, uh, is important. The patient refused a major uh, surgery, so we try to give a fixation uh, and stability, the anterior column stability with a vertebral plastic and a short fixation. Its work is not the, probably the most correct way to treat this kind of uh, fracture, but it's a possibility. The anatomy in that case uh, helped us because the posterior element was good, so we can uh, um, we could put uh, a cement inside without any risk to have uh, leakage into the spinal uh, canal. And this is the, the, the CT scan control. And uh, that was performed in early stages, and uh, we restore 88, 88 degrees of lower doses. That is uh, pretty good. More complex cases. Uh, B2 fracture in a young female. The problem is that often the trauma and the vertebra is not only of one vertebral body, but can comprise two or three. So we have to think that uh, we have to um, we have some A1 fracture, but we can have also uh, other very complex uh, fracture like the B2 because uh, the one below the B2 fracture is a. Uh, an A1 fracture. So we have to think about all the type of the fracture to think to how to treat. This is the MRI that you can show two fracture of the two level. And in that case, it was performed a long fixation to try to avoid a double level uh, corpectomy because if you perform a, a corpectomy of the B2 uh, vertebral body, you cannot put a cage on a um, a fracture um, vertebral body. So in that case, it was managed with a long posterior fixation. She was young, so the healing process uh, goes on, going very good. This is another case. You have three different kind of fracture. Uh, A3, that is the on the um, top level, 
while two wine a one uh, fracture on the below uh, was performed again a posterior fixation a percutaneous fixation just to avoid the um, free level corpectomy that probably it seems uh, too um, invasive in that case also because it is a young male so we don't we was not too aware about uh, failure of the system but the patients uh, after two months from the surgery had a second trauma. So the, uh, he had a mobilization of the, um, the screws of the below level and a new fracture again of the vertebra that was not completely healed. Yeah, the uh, example you can see on the left, I was after surgery and this is after two months and the screw loosening. So in that case, in the meantime, the below level was completely healed. So we perform um, a combined approach and we, we put an expandable cage that make subsidence just at the beginning. Probably the quality of the bone um, was not so good, but finally, this is the reconstruction, but finally after one year, the healing process is good and we have a fusion without any other level. So that can, you can consider also that sometimes your, plan can have some problem during the uh, follow-up time. And finally, uh, the most um, tricking uh, treatment is the circumferential reconstruction for the most complex uh, uh, fracture. You have to think that uh, the load sharing we have seen of the biomechanics of the spine is through the anterior part of the colon. So if uh, the disruption is on that part, we have to think about uh, reconstruction of the anterior part. Usually we can reach the anterior part by a combined approach posterior for a fixation and anterior to make the corpectomy and, um, and the reconstruction. This is one of the first cases that I performed some years ago. It's very, you can see it's very invasive. Now it's possible to perform also with a less invasive approach, also a combined approach. And the final you can perform um, a good reconstruction from anterior and then posterior element. This is the final X-ray. But uh, in the last years, uh, um, I try to understand if there is a less invasive approach because uh, to make an anterior approach, sometimes you need a thoracic surgeon or the general surgeon for the lumbar part. And uh, I try to minimize, not my uh, myself, because this is a familiar approach for many surgeons, to perform a circumferential reconstruction by a posterior only uh, approach. Also because the anatomy is on the right side is uh, our anatomy, the anatomy that uh, we are used uh, than the anterior one is less invasive because uh, um, we manage everything by uh, posterior. Yeah, just to show you that there is many, many papers that uh, show this part of uh, um, approach and this i go very quick you can perform also a monolateral approach if you don't have to decompress or preserve the posterior tension band like in this case you put the, your uh, your screw uh the structure just to give a stabilization a cranial caudal discectomy then i use the navigation it's not uh, obligatory mandatory to use it but it's help i perform uh, the corpectomy through the pedicle of the broken vertebra with the drill. I check with the navigation when I am arrived. This is the final canal. Then finally, I put an expandable cage into this hole. This is the most complex part because you have a very small uh, uh, hole through the dura sac and the uh, nerve root here where is the uh, yellow star is the nerve root. This is the footprint just to understand. And finally, you have to protect the dural sac and the nerve root and put your cage. I want to show you um, that in this phase that is very tricky, you have to change orientation of your uh, cage positioning. At the beginning, you can see that the instrument is from medial to lateral, just to inside the hole while the cage is inserted into the, um, the, the hole, 
I start to change orientation of the instruments and finally I go from lateral to medial when the cage is below the nerve root, so in a safe way, and I put inside. So if you have seen how they change, you can really understand how you can oh, angulate the uh, instruments to put in a safe way the, the cage into a very, very small hole. Obviously, it's very tricky in uh, upper thoracic part. You can clip also your nerve root so you have a, a more space, while from T9 to S1 is not possible. You have to try to avoid this uh, to prevent a neurological um, deficit. Obviously, it's uh, challenging. You, have, uh, you need an expandable cage, otherwise it's very difficult. In, and in L5, you have to consider the sucker slope due to the angulation of the cage itself. This is uh, probably the most complex case that I manage with this approach, a very complex uh, um, C fracture of two vertebral bodies with an hematoma, the, the patient was complete, uh, had a complete uh, spinal cord injury. And this is the final uh, reconstruction. So it's also possible to perform a two level corpectomy by a posterior approach. And uh, uh, this is a, a, a recovery surgery. The, the patient was operated on by other surgeon. The fracture doesn't heal. So we perform this approach and uh, we obtain also a correction of the kephotic. Yeah, I have some questions. You asked me some questions, so tell me how do you want to proceed? If there uh, is a bit more some question about the presentation before my question to audience. Uh, we will, we, what we will do is we will do these questions afterwards. Uh, okay. First, we will, we can, we'll take questions and uh, Greg and Doug, uh, hi, you both are there, so the, the combo is back. Uh, and they hi, hi, good to see you. Good Doug. morning. Uh, good evening, by the way. So, uh, <laughs> so we just um, drag I, your butts out of bed. So, <laughs> so, um, uh, carry on. But can, I, can I just ask Francisco one, one question to start with? Um, yes, as we, as we get into I see that you do a lot of uh, percutaneous instrumentation, um, across and then, and then don't do any fusion with it. Do you go back and take the screws out later? Sorry, because, sorry, I put uh, my microphone up more. Can you repeat? Okay. Yes, you do a lot of percutaneous instrumentation of, of fractures, and at least that's what it, it looks like. And I don't, uh, and I don't see any fusion um, in those areas. So do you go back and remove the screws later on since you're instrumenting across a non-fused segment? Yeah, when I perform open surgery, obviously I perform also posterior fusion. When I perform percutaneous, uh, I, it's not a, a fusion uh, procedure, but just for uh, the healing process of the vertebral body. While on the, um, I do perform a minimal invasive lateral approach. Uh, so in that case, uh, I think uh, it's necessary to perform a kind of fusion, a posterior fusion, but uh, I never perform a minimal invasive percutaneous or lateral approach uh, for fractures. So uh, in all the cases that I show, the fusion is uh, by an anterior, if there is a cage, I use the bone that I remove from the vertebral body to obtain fusion and I obtain also posterior uh, fusion. While in the percutaneous uh, is not uh, and not perform fusion, but just to try to stabilize the column and uh, to obtain a natural uh, healing of the fracture, but uh, is some uh, in some cases. But do you go back at a later point in time and remove the instrumentation? Yeah, since in, there in is no fusion. Yeah, in, in young patients, if the, um, the vertebral fracture is completely healed, I remove and nothing else. If there is no fusion uh, and you have to perform a recurrence uh, surgery, I remove and uh, you have to obtain the fusion in uh, some way for, for sure. Okay. Uh, okay. So hopefully you guys can see this. There's yeah, we can. Here. Yeah, we see okay. it, Greg. All right. Oh, Doug, do you have your terrible uh, internet connection again? Uh, I'll let you know. 
<laughs> okay, any more questions for um, Greg? Are you, are you looking at the chat? Yeah, no, I was thought we were going to do cases. Yeah, we will, but if there are any questions, uh, let me just go through some of the questions. Let's go through them because I'm just trying to. Uh, so, uh, Francisco, there's a question from Bichari Yakubui who's saying, What is your indication for kyphoplasty in trauma cases? Okay, uh, I don't love at all uh, kyphoplastic, uh, so um, I don't use uh, a lot. I, I think uh, it's a good indication uh, um, in. Uh, early phases of the, the fracture because you can, uh, with the balloon, obtain the restoring of the height of the vertebral bodies. And uh, in my experience, uh, we perform just in some osteoporotic uh, patient, not too old, obviously, uh, because I don't like at all uh, in a young patient to put uh, acrylic cement. So. This is why I don't use uh, at all uh, capoplasty, but, uh, but it's the same concept, I think, for the percutaneous fixation. If the same indication, a young patient with a, a little collapse of vertebral body in the early phases of the um, trauma, you can really restore the hide, and in that way, you can put uh, cement. It's just uh, my feeling about acrylic cement in the, in the young patients while the biological cement. Uh, is too really too expensive and is very difficult to to have for a um, young patient. Also, if I think probably is the best indication because if you don't have instrumentation, the it's just a percutaneous with two needles. Uh, so uh, I think can be uh, a good solution in in some cases. But uh, really, is very close to our percutaneous indication. The first cases that I show. Uh, that I show you. Okay, so there's another question. If you've got a Asia A patient, uh, yes. would you perform percutaneous uh, screws and rely on ligament axis? Yeah, uh, this can. It depends from the fractures because uh, if it's too long, the instrumentation that I need, I don't love uh, at all the percutaneous fixation because uh, the, um, the, the reducing maneuver is uh, more complex uh, and especially to put the rod, uh, if you have a four, five, six level of fixation may be very complex. So in that case, uh, because uh, the fracture is very important, I prefer um, an open procedure also to obtain fusion, a posterior fusion, if I don't go uh, by anterior part. While uh, if a very short fixation, uh, yes, I, I do in, uh, in this way. Okay, and there's a question from Dr. Tauber. He's asking um, TP fixation for correction of kyphotic deformity. And he's asking what degree of uh, correction you get by TP fixation when you're trying to do kyphotic deformity correction. And how many degrees um, uh, of cob angle would you be able to correct by short fixation or long fixation? Oh, obviously with, so, with short fixation, uh, the correction is not too high. Uh, I show you some cases uh, was uh, till six to eight degrees also because uh, uh, is the indication of a, a short fixation, in my opinion, obviously. While when you perform a very long fixation, you are able to and in an open surgery, in that case, you are able to correct um, more degrees also because the forces that uh, the, the new instrumentation that uh, are on the market allow you really to perform very important correction also more than 20 degrees of kyphotic, kyphotic uh, deformity with distraction and reduction. So it's, it's really also because the vertebra is broken so the, the column is uh, in time, if you have many degrees, uh, usually is uh, because uh, you have also disruption of the ligaments. And so you are able to make also very important uh, the compression. Otherwise, if you have to perform um, correction of many degrees, you can disrupt the posterior element just to help you and then to obtain in that part of the fusion. So uh, it, it depends on what, by the type of the trauma, really. And uh, so it, with short fixation, I think more than 10 degrees is quite impossible and it's not necessary usually. 
due to the indication of a, a short fixation. Otherwise, it's an incorrect uh, solution to perform a, a short fixation if you have uh, a more than uh, 15 degrees of uh, kyphotic deformity. You need more strength structure. Okay. There's a question about thoracolumbar junction fractures. That do you use uh, pedicle screws in the fracture segment by reducing the screws to six instead of eight? Yeah. If, if, if it's possible, uh, yes, uh, I, um, I like to put uh, a screw, a short, if uh, it's not possible to make a, a long screw, a short screw, just uh, to reduce the forces for the correction. So in that case, uh, I, I put a, at, at least one, sometimes uh, you cannot put uh, both screw, but at least one just to um, obtain a, a better load sharing of the forces uh, to the instrumentation and the fracture. Okay, we have a last question. There's Gerald Musa who's raising his hands and want to ask a question. I'm, I'm unmuting him. Gerald, you, would you like to ask a question, please? Oh, hello. Gerald, yes, we can hear you. Yes. Okay. No, thank, you very, thank you very much for the very good lecture. It's a very informative, thank you. Uh, my, my question is on the spinal shock. Um, what are some of the factors that you consider when you get a patient with spinal shock? Since uh, some, some literature say that you can have spinal shock that lasts even after 24 hours. So how do you go around your surgical management with regard to spinal shock? I'm sorry, but uh, the, the quality was not good of the, my microphone. Can you repeat? Because I hear some, just yes. the beginning at the end of the question, sorry. Okay, uh, is it clear now? Yeah, a little bit better. Okay. So uh, my question is with regard to a patient with spinal shock. Okay. Uh, it, it, it's very difficult to tell the extent of cord injury in spinal shock. And some literature says that a patient can have spinal shock lasting more than, even more than 24 hours. So how do you plan your surgical management with regard to a patient with uh, spinal shock? Hi, this is a very pertinent uh, question because I, I think it's very hard um, to find uh, um, a unique response about this kind of patient because uh, if uh, on the one hand uh, you, we have seen that the early surgery, early management provide better results for the um, neurological recovery. On the other hand, this kind of patient have also other problems and uh, the early management may be difficult. So it depends if uh, what is the clinical practice, the, the clinical uh, picture of the trauma. Um, I try to obtain all the neuroradiological information about these uh, uh, patients, especially the MRI. Uh, sometimes uh, you have to fight to obtain a wall MRI if uh, the level of suspicion is more than one level. Um, so the first part of the answer is try to obtain all the information before to come to the operating room, according to the facilities of uh, your hospital, because uh, this is uh, another key point, because I can say to you that uh, you need to have an X-ray, a, a complete CT scan, a complete MRI, but uh, if to obtain this, uh, you need uh, one week uh, I think that is not an answer. So you have to think about the facilities to try to obtain all the information from a clinical point of view and a radiological point of view and try to manage patient by patient. Also because every patient, every trauma patient is different one to each other. So you have to think about uh, that specific case, that specific fracture, if there is a compression, what kind of compression is and uh, to think about this because if you have a complete spinal cord injury um, due to dislocation probably an early surgery doesn't change uh, at all uh, the neurological recovery of the patient so while an early surgery may the patient have uh, more blood losses so you have to consider if there is also um, other trauma other um, injuries so uh, the management is around the patient you have to think about the patient on that, that specific patient that, that I show you are just a general indication, but after you have to think specific for the patients.
Yeah, I think uh, you have to, because this is a separate topic in itself, spinal shock. And if you talk about it, we'll be here yeah, forever. We, we're going to have a comment from Doug. I'll make, I'll make one, I'll make one, one comment. Um, sure. So if you, look at, if you look at indications for surgery, someone in spinal shock on a TLIX score is going to be either two or three just for starters. And that's without even looking at posterior ligamentous complex and, and morphology. So, you know, those patients are all going to end up having surgery unless there's something really uh, un unusual about their, uh, their, their, their fracture morphology. Uh, but so spinal shock probably doesn't, doesn't matter in those cases. You know, they have a bad injury and they're likely going to require surgery, whether it's for stabilization or potentially neurologic recovery. And Doug? Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think that, the, you know, the, I think that the data, although not conclusive, is, is clear that earlier is better, both from a standpoint of neurologic recovery, but also a lot of these patients have significant pulmonary injury and things like that. And so just the ability to mobilize the patients, I think, cuts a lot of the postoperative complications. And so, you know, and I, I don't really personally think that much in terms of spinal shock. If they've got a severe cord injury and they've got compression, I want them decompressed and stabilized. Okay. Shall we move on to um, uh, the cases? Thank you, Francisco. Good. It was a wonderful talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, so we have Greg Frost here, our friend who's going to be here. Sandeep is joining us as well. So welcome, Sandeep. Hi, th Hi everybody. Good evening, Sandeep. So, uh, Doug and I decided that I would show, show cases and he would moderate. Uh, uh, we will ask questions and the responses will, will be uh, probably binary, either yes or no or operator. People can feel free to put on the, on the chat uh, what, what their choice will be. So first case, is a 58-year-old man involved in a rollover motor vehicle. Uh, every accident in Wisconsin begins with rollover. Um, <laughs> he comes to the emergency room. He has uh, back pain only. He's immobilized on a longboard. Uh, he goes to an outside facility and has a CT scan done and has an injury, which I will show you. Uh, but he comes in uh, with really no neurologic complaints and no deficit back pain only. Uh, and this is his, uh, his imaging study. I think that's it. So there's the axial, and there's the the uh, uh, Sandro reconstructed CT scan. So he has uh, a burst fracture at L2 with about 60% oh, canal compromise. So we need uh, so some just questions as here. A first first step. Do you want an MRI or not? So Salman, how do they do yes and no on this? All right, that's, well, okay, so we're seeing a lot of yeses. Three yeses, four is five yeses. Uh, yeah, basically everybody's saying yes. Yeah, you know what I say? <laughs> I know what you I say. say. Yes, I think if it's possible, <laughs> uh, give uh, different information by a CT scan and uh, you have information also about the disc that uh, may be very difficult to understand by a, a CT scan. So if it's available and it's possible, I think it's better. But uh, if uh, to obtain an MRI, you have to wait uh, many, many days because the facility is uh, not available. You this uh, With this, this CT scanner, you can uh, decide uh, correctly what, what to have you to do. I, I'm... I was always taught if I'm going to order a study, it has to change my management. I don't think there's anything I'm going to see on an MRI that's going to change my management of this patient. I'm going to do the same thing regardless of what the MRI shows. Yeah, that's cool. If you're going to if, if, if you're going to operate on the patient, you're going to take the disc out anyway. Well, maybe not. Uh, but uh, this is uh, the different uh, legislation from uh, the different countries. Uh, in my country, you, if you have an MRI, you have to perform MRI. It's just a, from a, a legal issue. It's not uh, probably from a, a, 
Uh, I'm in a uh, clean time. Greg, yeah. Greg, Greg and I practice in the most litigious country in the world. Yeah. And neither of us wanted an MRI. Yeah. So um, he was he was given options of surgery versus uh, no surgery. Remember, neurologically intact with good sagittal alignment. Uh, so who wants to operate? Operate or not operate? I'll say operate versus brace. Surgery. How's that? Surgery. Surgery, 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 surgery. Ooh, everybody says operate. That's okay. why I show this case. So uh, I think some of the reason that people want to operate is because they see this, this bone in the canal of the patient's neurologically normal, all right? Um, and so he was given the option of brace versus no brace. And in the U.S., uh, a lot of patients are, are actually braced with this, this exact scenario because what happens to that bone fragment uh, when it's left alone? It, it resorbs. It goes away. Um, and I've seen patients with up to 90% canal compromise that are treated in a brace, not that I wanted to treat a person in a brace, but that had uh, a resolution of, it never developed a deficit and had uh, reconstruction or reconstitution of their canal to about 80% of what was normal and never had surgery. So there's a lot of bracing that goes on in the US. And the things that drive us to operate are kyphosis, uh, because those fragments that are, uh, uh, in a kyphotic deformity tend not to resorb as well, uh, and neurologic deficit. Those are the two major reasons to think about operating on people. So he actually um, opted for a brace uh, and went on and had a brace um, and then uh, had this picture taken. Um, and this is uh, what I become involved because this is my partner's patient. And uh, he left town and said, can you go up and see this guy? So now what happens is the guy stands up uh, his legs are, are actually now weak, uh, and he defecates on the, uh, basically on the person examining him, uh, but didn't know he did it. So the question becomes here, um, it's not, not so much a question of surgery or no surgery, but another study or surgery immediately, I think is the, are the two choices. So immediate surgery or another study, and you can feel free to put in what other study you'd like. No, okay, one person wants an MRI. Anybody else? That's it, so one vote for MRI. Um, and I think that might be, um, so MRI, MRI follow up with images. So I think some of this also um, depends on uh, what, what approach you want to do for surgery. So this is about three or four days into his course. He's now developed a deficit, which he didn't have before. So the question is uh, anterior versus posterior or, or both. I know what Doug would pick. <laughs> so it looks Post like the general consensus is everybody wants to go posteriorly. Huh. Haven't seen an anterior yet. Okay, let me put that in. <laughs> yeah, everybody's going okay. posteriorly. Okay. What would you do, Doug? I, I, again, you know, the, the key to this patient and his outcome in the long term, get, given that he's now got neurologic compromise, is an adequate decompression. At three days, things are starting to get a little stiff, so ligament taxis isn't going to work quite as well. He's also got, a, you know, he's shown that his anterior column isn't particularly competent. So in this particular patient, I would do a, a, an anterior corpectomy uh, put in a strut graft. I don't like fancy expensive expandable cages because in the United States, those cages cost 6,000 bucks and I can get a piece of allograft fibula or I can take a hunk of the patient's iliac crest for next to nothing. And so I would do an anterior strut and a plate. With a fibula? 
uh, not a fibula. Fibula is not strong enough. I would use a, a femur or tibia. Yeah, I knew you'd misspoken. Yeah, sorry. Um, and then would you instrument in the front or? I, I would plate not? anteriorly. I, I would do I would do an anterior plate. A little bit biased by who I trained with. Right. <laughs> Uh, so he said, so the question is there, what's causing the neurologic deficit? Well, he's a big chunk of bone in his canal. So I don't think that that's um, too much. It's, it's interesting in that a lot of people have gone posterior. And um, back, back uh, when I trained, we sort of always said, go where the pathology is. Um, and from my perspective, I think the, the advantage of going anterior is that you can recreate the column that's deficient, uh, which is the, the, the ventral column. The posterior elements are generally okay. Um, I think you can get a nice big bone graft in there that covers the, uh, the end plate. And ideally you wanna cover at least uh, 60 to 70% of the end plate with, with uh, bone or cage. I have the same bias against cages that, that Doug does. Um, and that is that they have a fairly large footprint that's metal and a fairly, small column that, that allows bone to incorporate. Certainly you can pack bone around them and so forth, but the actual amount of bone that heals through the center of those expandable cages is not quite adequate uh, in, in, in my opinion. The, so, the, um, a question so you're aware of coming, our biases. A question that's yeah. been coming up, Greg, is using femur as a graft, not autograft right. femur, allograft femur. Allograft femur. Yeah. So um, cadaveric so allograft. We, we also have the advantage in that we have a fairly uh, bone bank in, in the US. Yeah. So we get uh, fairly large sizes of femur and tibia and so forth. So that's an advantage of, of, of where we are. Certainly in places where you don't have that, expandable cages are, are, are satisfactory uh, or other, other options. Iliac so, crest is taking iliac crest is, is acceptable as well. Um, that there you can use the, the patient's own. A couple of the other questions that seem to have been coming up, people are commenting that yeah. go, going anteriorly seems much more involved. I think a lot of that is local and training bias. Um, I, I alluded to the fact earlier that that uh, you know because of my training, I actually trained at the same institution as Greg is at. Uh, and Tom Zadeblik, who is there, was one of the pioneers of anterior surgery, and we did a lot of it. And so as a result, you know, if you're doing it commonly, it's not that big a deal. Um, so I, I think a lot of it is, is training bias and local practice. But um, my my, as I say, my preference here, because I can do the best decompression anteriorly, that this is the, the, the I would go anteriorly. Um, and there are questions about why not a posterior fusion with it, or uh, what about stability? And I think some of this gets to the uh, to the nuances of doing a good ventral operation. Yeah. Um, so you cannot be fearful of getting very far anterior here, which is what I typically do. Is I I try to basically have the front edge of my graft as close to the ventral vertebral bodies as I can, uh, put a very large size graft in, and then with my instrumentation, cheat just a little bit posterior. So you get a little bit of a three point bending construct out of there. Um, and the, the literature has shown that a ventral only procedure is completely adequate in this, in this setting. Are you the, a comment? the other comment I would make for the people who are asking about getting an MRI to look at the, at the posterior ligamentous complex. Um, the, though, if on this upright view, there was an anterior translation across the fracture site, then you know that the posterior elements are not intact and you would do something different. You have the advantage here of having the, the axially loaded film, um, which you usually don't, you, you don't usually have initially in the trauma bay. Greg, you appear frozen. Your internet's bad today, Greg. Greg, where are you gone? 
Amjad, do you want to comment on this? No, I think I, I agree here because uh, although the MRI traditionally, uh, in terms of diagnosis, it can change diagnosis in 40% of the cases. In 24% of the cases, it will tell you about the integrity of posterior element. And in 16%, it will change your decision about the management. But here, uh, as uh, Douglas said, you got the uh, advantage of having the axial loading X-ray and the CT scan it shows you the exact morphology of the fracture. So I don't know how much MRI is going to contribute. And in terms of fixation and technology technique, it depends. Uh, what are you comfortable doing with? How often you using which technique? And, with, and the technique in your hand, if it's giving you good results, either anteriorly or posteriorly, I think I'll stick with that. We're getting the good results with that. In terms of the uh, economy, I think I agree allograft here would be a better option than using the expensive cages. I preferably, I will do it from the front anteriorly. So that's, can you, am I back on you guys? Yeah, you are Greg. Okay, yeah, I, I for some reason my internet went out. It's, but it's this is your turn this week. <laughs> you spoke too early. <laughs> Yeah. So, uh, so this is what I did. I just took a big piece of, of femur, um, and used uh, an anterior plate. And this is the Z plate two or whatever they call it. Um, Z after Z now. Like vantage. Yeah. Which I, which I don't use. I actually use dual rod, uh, constructs laterally now, um, when I, when I do these. Um, so, uh, and once again, it depends what you're comfortable doing. And so I've, I was trained, to, to do these. Um, in fact, the, even though I have someone do the opening, I stand there the whole time because I know exactly what I want. Um, but as I said, I put the graft fairly far anterior and put the plate sort of behind the midpoint, a little bit behind the midpoint of the, of the graft, um, and then get bicortical fixation. Um, and in 20 some odd years of doing this, I've never had to go into a posterior uh, on this. So this is a disease that um, certainly can be treated anterior and can be treated posterior and it, it, it gets to surgeon's level of comfort and what tools are available. All right. Oh. All right. Uh, yeah, let's do this one. This is an 83 year old man uh, who was on safari in Africa. Um, he is in fact the uh, former uh, chair of, of medicine at our, at our institution. Um, he actually had a minor fall um, uh, and had back pain with it, no neurologic deficit, um, neurologically normal. Um, and he traveled back from, from Africa and got an, immediately saw what his film showed, got on a plane and, and flew back and presents back to the United States, neurologically intact. Um, he should note that he has a history of ankylosing spondylitis that he's done well with. So um, he comes in and gets worked up and this is his uh, CT scan. And this is after traveling back for, is, uh, for several hours. So like question, is this a stable injury or an unstable injury? Yeah, so everybody's agreeing this is either unstable or highly unstable. Okay. And then that means uh, who wants to do surgery on this versus not doing surgery on this? Surgery, surgery, surgery. Yep. Everybody wants to do surgery. Oh, there's one for a brace. Another okay. no surgery, another no surgery. Another no surgery, surgery. Conservative, conservative, so conservative. Looks, looks I'd say almost 50 50. So somebody yeah. there just said a two column injury by Denae. So the first is thing it? you got to remember when you have ankylosing spondylitis is you're no longer dealing with a spine. This is not a, a whole bunch of vertebrae stacked on top of each other with, with discs in between. This is a femur. This patient has the biomechanical equivalent of a femur fracture. 
there is no stable femoral shaft fracture. It doesn't exist. And unstable doesn't mean, mean surgery, uh, but it certainly does mean that you have to think about doing something. Yeah. Uh, once again, this is seems the theme of the day. One of my partner's patients, uh, who's not my <laughs> patient yet. Um, and I think he probably got an MRI. Um, I don't have the axial images. Someone wants an axial image. Trust me, there's, there's, this is exactly how much canal compromise he has, this much. Um, and he doesn't have, uh, is a little bit of hematoma, but not, not much hematoma in the canal, not, not a compressive amount of hematoma. So then I guess the question is, um, this one says dealing with a bamboo. Yeah, bamboo yeah. spine, fine. Three column injury, right? This goes through, through the disc space, through the posterior body, through the posterior elements. Yeah, so um, a, a comment that just come up is he was able to travel internationally Yep. Um, without, without injury. So, do, so does he really need surgery? I think that's a reasonable question. Mm -hmm. but my, yeah, my, my answer to that, is, so there, there's the two questions here, there's stability and healing. Um, you know, is this likely to be an injury that will heal if you uh, were to brace him? Um, and, and, you know, that's what's questionable. Gonna be, what's going to be difficult about bracing this man? He has a, he has a lot of kyphosis. Yeah. Already. And so most, most of the time that people will do bracing, he'll lie down and he'll open up in front uh, and be in an unnatural position. Um, and uh, uh, getting a brace, even if it's a custom made brace, will be uh, very, very difficult. A comment that just came up, somebody was asking about getting a DEXA to determine whether it would hold screws. In the ankylosing spondylitis patients, they're osteoporotic, period. All of them are. Um, second thing is actually, um, and you play around with it on your own imaging software, but there's now very good data that if you take it, an axial view, um, you can actually get a, a very good estimate of bone density just by looking at the average number of Hounsfeld units in the, in the Cancellus bone. Um, and if you, and so, um, if you take us, an, an oval within the vertebral body, not including the cort cortical walls at the midpoint of the vertebral body, if the average Hounsfeld units is under 100, you have osteoporosis and there you don't need the DEXA scan. You know, he's an 83 year old man with, with ankylosing spondylitis. Yeah. He, he has you osteoporosis. Know his, you know, his bone quality is yeah. terrible. Okay. So, uh, so for those that, that want to do surgery, uh, long, long segment versus short segment fusion. Long versus short. Long, long, long. One, One short, short, mostly longs. Long, long. Short. <laughs> short, lots of longs. One person says short segment fixation is adequate. And there's a few more coming up with short. Short. All right, Doug, what do you think? This is a femur fracture. You never do short segment fra fixation on a femur fracture. I, my background is orthopedic surgery, so I'm used to dealing with femur fractures. Um, but no, you cannot get biomechanical control in osteoporotic bone when you've got such long lever arms. I mean, essentially, this is the only spot his spine moves probably from somewhere up in the high thoracic spine down to his, down to his pelvis. Um, I don't think any short construct, cement augmented or not, is going to help. You have to go long on these patients. Right, and so is, is, there's, there's no downside to taking more motion segments. One, it's a lot of its thoracic spine and the rest of his spine doesn't move anyway, so you need uh, multiple points of fixation and lousy bone that improves the likelihood that you will uh, succeed. So uh, he decided he wanted surgery, whether it's a good idea or a bad idea. Um, so for surgery, 
would anybody, so would we do a monitoring or no monitoring for this case? That's my question, monitor or not monitor? One monitoring, monitor, 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 monitor. Somebody's asking, is TLIX valid here? No, this is this is a specific exemption in the TLIX classification and the AO classification. Um, the long rigid spine, it, that goes basically in both classifications straight to surgery. Okay, so we have, a. it looks about maybe, well, now it's 50, 50 monitoring versus no monitoring. Um, this case was actually done in the middle of the night for, for whatever reason. Um, so the, the, the risk point here for, for neurologic injury is the transferring him to the, to the prone position for surgery. So if you do not have access to monitoring, the other option here, your anesthesiologist is probably going to want to do an awake fiber optic anyway. They usually do an ankylosing spondylitis. Um, so your other option is to do awake positioning. So move him into position, then have him move his legs. If everything's moving well, put him off to sleep. And, and so you've monitored the important part. Um, personally, I would probably have monitored this. Yep. So the, the, the big risk, I think, with this guy is positioning him with all the kyphosis he has. Right. What's going to happen? Standard Jackson table. Uh, an, an Allen table, you put a pat on the hip, a pat on the chest, and what happens is he, he opens up and distracts. Um, certainly, because while we can do fluoroscopy, it actually is a little bit difficult to see with the fluoroscopy. Yeah. So you have to come up, you have to come up with some way of positioning him so that he stays in the position that that he's in. Yeah, so this, this is actually, this, go ahead, Doug. This, this is one where actually, um, I actually, I, uh, it's the rare indication that I will use a Wilson frame for, for spinal instrumentation. Because with a Wilson frame, you can essentially, by, by changing the arc of the Wilson frame, you can control the amount of kyphosis you want to give this guy. Certainly. And certainly you could do this, you know, long, uh, long segment uh, percutaneous instrument at two. Yeah, that's so you really that, you don't really need a fusion for this. Yeah, that would be my choice is phone. actually long, long segment percutaneous fixation. So this was done and the patient woke up uh, with a significant neurologic deficit. Oh. Um, right. Yeah. <laughs> now I become involved. <laughs> 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 Which is what happens at my place? Hey, I got a problem. Can you come take a look? Um, so this this is a demonstration of what happens when one you don't use monitoring, and two you don't pay attention to the um, positioning challenges. Yeah. Um, it turns out that the it, well we we know that the the uh, force that the um, that spinal cord tolerates least is tension. So when you stretch it out, it doesn't like it at all. Um, and so uh, really the, 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 the point of this is just exactly this, is to be careful positioning and to do monitoring. So I got involved in it and um, this was actually not, not too difficult to actually get back in, posi uh, back in a corrected position. So um, we uncoupled this posterior hardware. Uh, we actually, I did a, a way to have a way to build up um, using blanket rolls. Uh, so that he gets a kyphotic position, and then you can actually compress. Um, you can you can fix either end of it, and you can sequentially compress along the rod and get it to line back up again. And so uh, this is just his MRI, MRI, and then this is what he ended up with. So, uh, and he actually recovered uh, from his deficit. He uh, this was done in the middle of the night, and he woke up and. It was probably about seven or eight o'clock in the morning that he was having a problem. And then this was back in the operating room by about noon. Um, and so that's where, um, this is where, so this is, so this is just a reminder to pay very close attention to positioning and consider monitoring. And he's 83. Uh, yeah, the comment is, I think the surgeon has distracted more. Yeah, the, the surgeon didn't distract, the patient distracted after he was positioned. And this is the, the whole point of being um, 
very careful about about positioning in these patients. All right. Do we have? Uh, I don't want to do this. Should we, should we do one more? Okay, we can do one more. Then we have MCQs yeah. left. Yeah, go on. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna do this case. Um, I don't want to do this one either. That's simple. Um, let's do this one. This is a. This is a young man. Uh, I think a 19 year old. Uh, who comes in after motor vehicle accident, he has back pain only and has a normal neurologic exam. And so in our institution, everybody gets a CT scan. Um, and I think that's what I have here, right? So this is what he has. And Francisco talked about this. So this would be uh, one for us to look at. So comments about uh, what this is. Right, we see a fracture. Can you guys see my, air, my pointer at all? Yes, we can. Okay, so fracture through the spinous process, uh, fracture through the posterior element. The other side, it looks like it's disrupted the or posterior element again. The pars. Yeah, sort of, sort of through the pedicle. So, what type of fracture is this? One person says chance. One says else, bilateral pars fracture. MRI flexion distraction injury. So, so being being pedantic as I always am, um, this isn't actually a chance fracture because a chance fracture is purely bony. Well, there's two types of chance fractures, bony and ligamentous. Yeah, but, but if you look at, again, being I'm being chance. pedantic, Greg, you know that's what I do. What that's chance job. described was a purely bony injury. Right. And this actually, when you look at it, um, actually does just go through uh, through the body here. That's this little, little bit of density here. I think so? Oh, okay. Yeah. So I, I thought yeah. this was one that might go through the disc, but yeah. But no, I, it, yeah. Didn't, it didn't, it didn't. Because an MRI, yeah. it, just, it just goes through the through the body and I don't know if I have the MRI okay. uh, on here or not. All right, so so where's the instantaneous axis of rotation in a, in a chance fracture? Is it- Posterior uh, through the vertebral body or anterior? Classic description, anterior body or posterior? So I've got a couple of anteriors, anterior, Through the vertebral body. Yeah, like he's just describing a fracture. Through the body. body. Anterior and posterior. Oh, yeah, you can't have two instantaneous axes of rotation. <laughs> That's really dynamic. Yeah. All right. So, uh, so in a true chance fracture, the instantaneous axis of rotation actually sits anterior to the vertebral body. Uh, and, and we know that in this case, because there's really not any uh, compressive element within the, within the vertebral body itself. Um, yeah. 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 And the flexion distraction burst combination, that's where you see the, the fracture through the vertebral body or the instantaneous axis rotations through the vertebral body. But if you don't have the bursting component, it's, it's anterior. So recall that with instantaneous axis rotation, that everything in front of it would get smaller as in a, in a compression fracture and everything behind the instantaneous axis of rotation gets, gets wider. So you can see that on almost, uh, you can figure out where the IAR for almost any injury is just by looking at, at the lateral films. So the question, this is a purely bony injury, um, operate or not operate? Operate, operate, surgery, surgery. No surgery. So it looks about two thirds operate, one third, one third no surgery. Right. This is this is one of those um, classic things where where people say, well, it's a three column injury, you have to operate on it. And in fact, the the chance fracture is uh, the only one of the only three column injuries that you can treat in a brace if you if you so choose. So then uh, let's say we operate. Um, all right, so uh, I think a brace would be, uh, would be a, a reasonable option in this, right? Because 
what happens is he counteracts the 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 moment that caused this trauma by by standing up. They put on a hyperextension brace. Uh, you have once again compression and extension, which is exactly the opposite of his injury, which which could heal. And I've treated several chance fractures with a brace. Um, this is my um, one of my pediatric partners' cases since I don't do kids, but I thought it was a good example. So uh, so those who do operate, anterior or posterior. Posterior, 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 okay. And then the next, the next question is. Yeah, so everybody's going posteriorly, which is okay. appropriate because that's okay. where it failed. Okay, so now long segment or short segment fixation? One long, a bunch of shorts, long. Okay. So it looks like it's going about three quarters long, or sorry, no. three quarters short, one quarter long. Okay. So what has what has failed in this in this patient? <laughs> Somebody said fucking long. <laughs> <laughs> Joe Cock. No. So what what L, what has failed in this? Right. That's that's the question. So from a biomechanical standpoint, what has failed? Since we talked about biomechanics, what's failed? PARs, poster elements. What has failed? All right, so what has failed is a tension band, correct? Yeah, we're talking about biomechanical element that failed. So does this, so then knowing that the tension, it's a tension band failure, my question once again is long or short? Okay, so tension band failure, long segment or short segment? We've got a couple of longs, okay. So does a tension band function based upon its length? It does not. A tension band strength is gained by its distance from the instantaneous axis of rotation. So in fact, uh, this is a perfect case for a short segment fixation, right? When you reconstruct a tension band, it only needs to be short, it doesn't need to be long. You're not, if it's a three point bending construct, where you're trying to create some correction, then it's a long construct. All right, so so Doug, that's right. So you can see through the through the vertebral. Oh body yeah, yeah. That it, that it's pure bony. I didn't remember what I had down here for things, but this is what he ended up having done. It was a, having done was a posterior short segment fixation um, with percutaneous percutaneous screws, and then actually had his instrumentation taken out uh, six months after this was done. So that's about what I have for today. I have other cases, but this is. This okay, is what great. We I, I think this is a very well done. Um, thank you, Greg and Doug. I think you both did a great job. Uh, you're going to go to uh, multiple choice questions that Francisco made, and we're going to uh, unmute. Francisco, so yeah. you can you can share your screen. Yes, well, and, I can. and maybe uh, Doug and yourself can go through this one. Sorry, I have to find because everything is closed. One second. Um, maybe you can just read on this. We have everything up here in front okay. of you. You have uh, okay. So it looks like you guys. It looks like someone has hacked into this. Yeah, there's just a bunch of inappropriate comments. Yeah, we are we are uh, just um, trying to. So this is we have removed some people. So let's remove them. Uh, this person as well. Yeah. All right. Let's see. If we... Okay. Let's let's do this and then wrap this up. Okay. Yes, Francisco. Yes, but. Uh... A very uh, simple question regarding uh, 
Uh, my topics uh, and are focalized uh, mainly to the residents. Obviously, some questions are very easy uh, in the mailing about this. Uh, so the first was, uh, uh, what is the most common site for torque columbian fracture? Here you have uh, five uh, options from L1 to L3 to T8 to T10, L3, L5, T11, L1, T10, T12. That's the first one. Okay. Okay, we, we'll move on. We'll go through the questions and we'll see the answers directly. We just want to move on and finish this today. Okay, go next. No, 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 no. Just go on to the question again. One, Sorry. One, one second, one second, sir. One second. Second question. Otherwise, I reopen my presentation. It's not a problem. No, it's fine. We have it here. It's okay. Uh, yeah. I know you are a bit, but. Time of healing of vertebral fracture is. Yes. You dis yeah, yeah, you discuss this. Yeah. Yeah, I think they can read. I, I think this is important just to try to understand how to manage some kind of uh, fracture because uh, time is important for uh, young people, especially for young people. So from two to four weeks, uh, four to six weeks, eight to 10 weeks, uh, more than 12 weeks or none of the above. Looks like most people are saying C. Yeah. Okay, good. Eight Let's ten. move on. Three. Okay. Abrance Quarta syndrome may be caused by hyperflexion trauma, hyperextension trauma, only compressive trauma, penetrating trauma, all the of the above or non. Looks like from all the above, so D. Penetrating. Okay, so fourth. Yeah. In case of vertebral fracture with spinal cord injury, immediate surgery is mandatory. Early surgery within 24 hours is advocated. Surgery is never indicated. The last surgery after 24 hours is always indicated. Uh, lots okay. of bees. Lots yeah. of bees, yeah. Yeah. Good. And finally, the most unstable torque lumbar fracture is compression, burst, flexion distraction, or fracture dislocation. Just to understand if uh, they are sleeping during my presentation. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's see the responses. Let's see yeah, the replies. It's mostly these. Yeah. 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 So, can you take us to replies, um, Imad? Yes, sir. That. Okay, so first question Torah Lumber Factors. Yeah. Okay. Yep. okay, good. Time of healing. Number two, eight to ten weeks. Yeah, yeah. yeah some some people were sleeping during that time, but yeah. That's yeah. Away. <laughs> <laughs> okay, three. Was by penetrating oh. trauma. Mm -hmm. I hope all the all the same people who were sleeping and not different kind of people. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and vertebral fracture of the spinal cord injury. Get them down. Early surgery within 24 hours is yeah. indicated. Um, okay. Yeah. Immediate surgery or uh, immediate surgery. It's only that is a mandatory. I, I think it's a too strong uh, uh, a statement that uh, yeah. is mandatory. Is uh, but uh, the concept is similar, but uh, yeah. the the mistake here is uh, just the term mandatory. Okay. Agree. Five. Oh. Fracture dislocation, but uh, seat belt injury, that's the chance fracture. All right, most most people did okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay, brilliant. I don't think we'll go through the presenter's feedback. We'll send the feedback to uh, Francisco. Um, or sh shall we look at Greg's anyway? <laughs> <laughs> Good. Uh, okay, so this is Greg's, is it? So this is, uh, no, this is Greg, quality of evidence. Uh, I think uh, they're saying more than 90, that's 97% good and yeah. excellent. Great, let's go down. Quality of content, you know, uh, it's 95%. Excellent, go down. A question that just came up and then it came up a couple times in it, I just saw in the thing is, 
Sure. How do you prevent screw pullout in ankylosing spondylitis? Two things: make lots of screw, lots of fixation points on a long construct, and get your alignment right. Okay, and overall presentation again. Let me go down a bit. So again, same, 95%. And would you like to have the same presenter again? That's a big question now. Let's see that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. There are a few people. I think Doug and uh, Francisco doesn't want to hear you again. <laughs> it doesn't matter. <laughs> okay. I, I think it's brilliant. Uh, thank you, guys. It was really, really, really nice. All right. See you guys yeah. later. All right. Yeah. Thanks, Stay Francisco. well, everybody. Salmi, so, do you want to... Really let okay. me know on what, talk to me on WhatsApp. Sure, no problem. Uh, Imad, are you sure showing us at our talks for tomorrow and Wednesday? Imad, are you there? Imad has gone to sleep, is it? Uh, Imad? Yes, sir, I'm showing. One second. It's like 6.30 there. <laughs> yeah, it's just, we break our fast in about 25 minutes, so. Oh, so everybody's got to go eat. I think it's, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that's for tomorrow. That's that's for tomorrow. So we have Danny Prevedello. Uh, he's going to be talking about pituitary tumor surgery, tips and tricks. And Amjad would be helping him uh, being the moderator. And for uh, Wednesday. Yeah, one second. For Wednesday, we have this Walter Jean and Dr. Azam. Oh, Azam, so, good for him. Azam is from uh, where Greg is, and uh, Walter Jean from George Washington. He's going to be talking about the approaches of um, skill based surgery. So, uh, and on, on Thursday, we actually have an uh, anatomy session, neuroanatomy rotan session for residents, and also have how to prepare for exam for residents. That's Thursday. So, all the residents are most welcome. Thank you, guys. You're going to say bye bye from Thanks. here. All right. Alrighty. Are you guys, eat uh, something. Back to work? Are you back to work? Yes. Yeah. Not not uh, not a full bore, but we're we're back working. Yeah, I go back this week. All right, great. Okay, so thanks a lot. Thanks for being there and, right. and see you in a week's time. Okay. Bye bye. Take care.